Amen. <laughs> well, good morning again, everyone. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 2. I want to bring a message today that I'm calling Under the Umbrella of Dependence. Under the Umbrella of Dependence. That's a strange title, I know. Most of us own an umbrella, don't you? Don't y'all own, own umbrellas, right? Yes. I wouldn't carry an umbrella for the first 50 years of my life because I didn't think it was macho to carry an umbrella, but I got tired of getting wet, so I finally gave in to the notion. But we don't usually think a, a whole lot about what goes on under an umbrella. Uh, mostly it's the act of trying to stay dry in the rain or trying to stay shaded in the sun. Recently, my family spent a few days uh, at the beach on vacation. Whenever we go to the beach, we, uh, we always set up beach umbrellas. This year, Colton, he, he added a tent, kind of like this one, uh, since the baby was born and all. And so he added that tent to our three umbrellas, and we looked like a tent city down there on the beach. But Taking all those tents and umbrellas and so forth to the beach and can be quite laborious sometimes, and kind of the thing in the morning that we dread, but, but it ends up being worth it because we spend so much time under those umbrellas. We, of course, find shelter under the umbrellas from the sun. I don't know about y'all, what y'all do at the beach, but we like to eat. So we eat there under the umbrellas. Sometimes we'll read a little bit while we're listening to the waves. We'll watch the ocean. I occasionally take a nap there because the ocean kind of puts me to sleep. And um, But they provide shelter for our towels and our chairs, coolers, and even our dogs. A lot goes on under those umbrellas. We play in the sand. Sometimes we listen to music. We have conversations. We laugh with one another. We tease with one another. And we simply take time there to rest. But I think the most important thing out of all those other things that go on, the most important thing that goes on under those umbrellas is what I would call relationship. <clears throat> That's where we gather as a family and we stake out our little piece of the beach for the day and we slow down and we postpone our cares and for several hours a day we just do life together. This relationship <laughs> means so much to us to, to stake out our little piece of the beach with our little tent city that uh, this year we were down there and a, a storm was brewing out over the, the ocean and Branson was watching the weather on his phone and he was saying, it's going to go on down the beach, we'll be all right, it's going to go down. I mean, you know, the weather on your phone is not always right. Well, it wasn't that day and the storm came in and it came in strong. Colton, Becca and Donna took the baby and to the car because we didn't want her out there, but the rest of us, we adopted an attitude, we shall not be moved. And we all grabbed the corner of the tent. Some of us grabbed an umbrella and another umbrella, and we staked down everything, and that storm blew through. And I thought it was the most ironic thing. There was a beach full of people in bathing suits that when the water started to fall, they all ran for cover. And I thought, I must, I must have a misunderstanding what a bathing suit's all about, because I thought they were supposed to get wet. But anyway, they ran for cover. There was only one other group that stayed on the beach and it was another tent city right down the beach but we hung on and we it was about 15 minutes that storm blew through and it was blowing wind and rain and we just hung on because that was our little spot on the beach when it when it was over that other tent city down there it looked like that old volkswagen commercial where about 20 people crawl out of the back of a volkswagen they came out of that tent city and they all went straight to the ocean and I thought, well, you could have just stood outside and gotten wet, but they went straight to the ocean and got wet. It was about 18 of them or something. But us and them, we decided we were going to stay and protect our umbrellas. And then the sun came out and everybody came back to the beach. But I want you to know that's, that's a picture of a relationship. We, we, we go through the, the good and the bad together. 
you know, laying around under the umbrella doing all those comfortable things. But when the storm comes up, we do that together too. And, and it's, it's a picture of a relationship. But I think it's a picture even more than that of, of a different kind of relationship, another kind of relationship, that of doing life with God and doing life under the umbrella of total dependence on Him. Dependence. It's the opposite of independence. All, all of us yesterday probably we celebrated in some way or another the 244th birthday of our great nation. We have a name for it. It's called Independence Day. And it celebrates the act of, of our founding fathers breaking free from Great Britain as a people and declaring independence and forming a new nation. We even have a flag that we fly to, to celebrate that independence. And if a lot goes on under this flag, there's a lot of meaning to this flag. Uh, some of you have served under this flag, and, and a lot of people have lost their lives fighting under this flag. And most patriots would agree that, that what they did back there 244 years ago was a good move on the part of our founders to make it in that time and under those circumstances, even though it took a long and, and costly war to secure that independence. So independence is a good thing in the right context. But independence, while it's, it's good in, in this kind of case, isn't always something to be pursued. This is especially true in our relationship with Almighty God. <coughs> We'd be more than foolish to intentionally declare our independence from God. Even though every lost soul on the planet has effectively done just that. Declared their independence from God. We're reminded just how dependent we are. Our cover verse today, if you print it off a bulletin, is from Psalm 16.8. It says, I will... Keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I shall not be moved. In other words, I am dependent on Him to be right there at my right hand. And I keep my eye always on the Lord. Is what the psalmist is trying to tell us here. So we, as Christians, we live under this flag. And that's a great flag, but this one's even better. We live under this flag. This flag is a flag of relationship with our Lord and Savior. This says we're part of a family. A family that only came through the, through the blood of Jesus. And so this is, this is our major flag. And I love America as much as anybody, more than most probably. And, and this is such an important flag. But this is our primary flag. This is the one we, we live under and have relationship under. However, we, even the blood-bought saints of Jesus Christ, though it, it happens much more unintentionally, we can also, by our attitudes and our actions, by our lack of actions, effectively declare our independence from God as well. So today I want to I look back and, and, and see what happens when we, when we live life under the umbrella of dependence on God. In fact, the Bible teaches that we are extremely dependent on God. Let me just give you three quick verses. The Bible says, as, as, as it pertains to the Father, James tells us every good thing, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good gift comes from our Father. <clears throat> As to the Son, Jesus tells us, John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches, and he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then God, the Holy Spirit, as it pertains to him, Jesus again tells us, in John 14, 26, <clears throat> but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So we're dependent on God. These three verses tell us we're dependent on God for what we get, for what we do, and even for what we know. We're absolutely dependent on Almighty God. Now these are just three of the many things that fall under the umbrella of dependence on God. And I could name a lot more, but I don't have time today. But there, let me let me name just a few. How about our existence? Just the fact that we're here means that we were dependent on God. Our provision, the fact that we probably ate breakfast this morning, we'll go home and eat lunch, we, we have clothes to wear and cars to drive, God is our great provider. We're dependent on Him. Yes, we work and, and, and make money to buy those things, but even our ability to work and the jobs that we've been given and all of that, that's all because of God. We're dependent on Him for provision. And then our protection. Again, we live in a wonderful nation. Compared to other nations, it's so much better. We are so protected. We have a great military, and, and we're so thankful for those men and women that serve. But even that is something that God has given us. And then our guidance through, our, through the dear Holy Spirit guides us in every step of the way. And, of course, our salvation. <laughs> we could have gotten that no other way but through, through God, through Jesus Christ. How about every beat of our heart? Every time our heart beats, every breath we take is a gift from God. We are so dependent on Him for that. And so all of these things and, and a whole lot more that we could talk about begin to describe the activity that happens under the umbrella of dependence that we have on God. So here's the question, what's in it for God? I mean, we've already seen we're dependent on God. He just provides everything. He does everything for us. We can do nothing without Him. We can know nothing without Him. But what's in it for God? I mean, after all, it's a relationship that goes on under this umbrella. And so what's in it for God? I mean, we can offer Him praise and thanksgiving and sacrifice and surrender, and all these are, are very appropriate responses. But just as there is... There was one most important thing that I and my family did under those umbrellas. Again, that was relationship. I think there's one thing that happens under the umbrella of dependence on God that I believe stands out above all the rest. So you're probably thinking, well, what is that? I'm glad you asked. For the answer to the question, I want, I want to take you first. You can turn if you want to, but it's just a verse. I'll, I'll just read it to you. The book of Genesis, in chapter 22. We've got a familiar story there about Abraham and Isaac. And you all know the story. It's the story where, where the Lord told Abraham to take his son Isaac and, and go up on a mountain and sacrifice him there to the Lord. To take that boy up on the mountain and, and kill that boy there. This was the, the son that Abraham loved so dearly. But Abraham being a man of God, trusting God, even though he was heartbroken over what was about to happen, Abraham did exactly as God instructed. But just before he was about to depart with his son to go to the mountain, here's what we read. Abraham, this is from Genesis 22, 5. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and I'm going to kill that boy. That's not what the passage says. It says, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Now, don't miss this, church. This was an act of obedience that translated into worship for Abraham. I believe that obedience is perhaps the greatest form of worship. And worship is the greatest thing that happens in that relationship under the umbrella of dependence on God. Why is that? Because it requires total dependence on on God. Real worship. 
involves total dependence on God. So what was it that Abraham in this case was depending on God for? Well, we're told the answer to that question all the way over into the New Testament in the Hall of Faith from Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 says this, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God was able to raise people up even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Abraham had a full dependence on God. He was going to do exactly what God said to do, but he had this full dependence on God, a faith in God that he was going to bring that boy back to life. He planned on killing him that day. His obedience was an act of worship, and that worship was motivated by his faith, faith being another way of saying his dependency on God. This is a picture of our salvation. We read in the Bible that no one can be saved unless they come through Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, and out of obedience. All of us who are under the blood of Christ, we have come that way. We've not, we don't try to come any other way. Because Jesus said, I'm the only way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So out of obedience to his word, we came through Jesus. We live now in total faith that when our time here on life is over, we're going to be ushered into heaven. We have faith. We are depending on Jesus alone to get us into heaven. If we're depending on anything else, we're not going to make it. But we're dependent on God. Every step of the way is a relationship it's even a salvation relationship. So let's focus in on the on, on worship for a few moments this morning. It's starting to get a little warm out here. We just hit July. By the way, this is um, it's ironic. July the fifth. This was the the exact date on the exact day of the week, July fifth on a Sunday morning. Five years ago today, I preached the first message at Love's Creek, other than the trial sermon. This is our this is my anniversary here. On this day. So here we are. Well, thank you. See, I'll give y'all a hand for putting up with me that long. <laughs> but we're here. The reason I say that we're here in July. And it's starting to get hot. So how would you like to maybe have a little bit of Christmas in July this morning? You want to do that? Maybe that'll make us feel a little cooler. If you didn't turn already, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. This is the Christmas story. But one of our greatest examples of worship in the whole Bible, I believe, is found right here in the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2. And we'll start reading in, in just the first couple verses. And, and listen carefully to these words. This is the words about the Magi, you know, the wise men that came from, from the east and, and uh, came to, to see the child Jesus. Here's what we read now. After Jesus was born, Matthew 2, 1, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. The Magi says, We've come here for a direct purpose. We have come to worship the king. Now, this worship service was, I want you to see this morning, very intentional. And that's very important. There was no sense of an afterthought here. Recently I was chatting with someone and asked whether they planned to attend church on a particular Sunday. I don't think they really thought about what they were saying that much, but here was their answer. Yes, since there's nothing better to do with all this COVID stuff going on, you going to attend church? Yes, yeah, since there's nothing better to do. What an answer, right? I remember watching a TV game show several years back. And they asked the question, what's the best day to sleep in? Of course, America's number one response were Sunday. Sunday. You guessed it, Sunday. That's the way a lot of people think about the idea of coming and worshiping. 
But it appears for these magi, at the first sight of this special star, they packed up everything and they set out traveling hundreds of miles across the desert on horseback, some would say camels. But, but all with a top priority of worship. Now contrast with me some other characters in the story. Let's read verses 3 and 4. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So here we have some other characters. We have Herod the king, we have the chief priests, we have the scribes. They were all very powerful people in that day. They were also very corrupt people. Read on with me in verse 5. And they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called the Magi, determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. Now we know the story. We know how this goes. What we know here is that Herod is using his newfound knowledge of the word of God that he received from these scribes, but he's going to use it to his own ends, or at least attempt to. After this pretense of worship, his real plan was to attempt to kill Jesus. Now listen, this is a, this is a lesson for us right here in these few verses. It simply says to us, we should be very careful about studying the Bible if our only intent in studying the Bible is simply to gain more knowledge. This is the reason for this is because knowledge brings conviction. And conviction, if it's unheeded, brings judgment. We read this in Luke 12. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of flogging will receive but a few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. In other words, when we begin to read the Bible, we need to read it for the right reasons. It should also be approached, always be approached with the intention of learning, but then taking that new knowledge and responding to it in obedience. So you know what's interesting here? Herod, King Herod, if we know the history, we know that he was literally months from his own death and his only chance of salvation had arrived practically on his doorstep. Boy, talk about grace. Talk about the grace of God. This was his chance to have all of his sins forgiven. And believe me, he had a lot of them, don't we all? It was his chance to have all of his wrongs righted. And what did he do? He did the same thing that a lot of people do every day when Jesus offers them his saving grace. He committed spiritual suicide by attempting to kill his only chance at redemption. How did he do that? By mishandling the Word of God. By rejecting the Savior that the Word of God told him about when the Savior came to man offering him salvation. Now again, contrast back to the Magi. Verse 9. And after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which had been seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy 
And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Remember verse 2? Remember verse 2 said they had very intentionally come there to worship. Ever wonder, church, how much it would change, even enhance our worship if we became more intentional about worship? The word come here, they've come to worship. Come in this case implies a really big deal in this context. It included months of preparation, hundreds of miles of travel across the desert. Now, I was thinking this morning, we simply walk out of an air-conditioned house into an air-conditioned car, turn a key, sit while we ride a few miles, step out of our car and come to worship. But it was a lot different for these folks. This was a very intentional thing. <clears throat> Each one of us have been given a gift. It's the exact same gift, no matter our income, no matter our position in the world, no matter anything else, we've been given the same gift. You know what it is? 100 and 68 hours in every week. You get the same as everyone else. No more, no less. What if we began to very intentionally dedicate some of the other 167 hours of a week to prepare, to, to anticipate this one hour of corporate worship? every week. wonder how that would change our one hour of worship. Notice again in verse 10, they saw the star and began rejoicing with exceeding great joy. Way back then, way over there, hundreds and hundreds of miles over into the east, they had already begun to rejoice with exceeding great joy joy before they ever even began their trip. Don't you know that was a festive journey? Think back for just a, just a couple seconds on your trip to church this morning. Were you filled with exceeding great joy because you were about to come and worship the king? They were. So much so that when they finally arrived, Verse 11 says, they fell down and worshipped. They fell down at the king's feet and worshipped him. The idea is, is, is simply this. Finally, finally, the culmination of months and miles, and we get to experience the, the culmination of the joy of worship. You think of, you think of worship in that way? with joyful anticipation? Or do you think of it sometimes as trudging off the church like that person that told me, well, since there's nothing better to do. Here's the point. Their worship began a long time before this moment where they fell down at the king's feet. You see, worship understood rightly is not an event at a certain place at a certain time I think what the Bible is trying to teach us here is that worship is a lifestyle I was uh, I was out walking and praying I go and pray as I walk a lot of days sometimes in the early morning uh, not too early sometimes it's in the morning I'll put it that way I'll take that back sometimes it's in the morning sometimes it's late in the evening as the sun's going down and and um, where we live, it's very quiet. It's out in the country. And it's just, God's creation is everywhere. I mean, it's, it's just all around us in such a beautiful way. And um, I was out walking. And, and I just happened to look down as I was walking. And I started seeing some ants. And I started thinking about the ants. Because the day before, I've been listening to the radio. And, 
and learned some things about dolphins and trees. Y'all think, well, what are you, what are you doing? You're worshiping, but I was seriously, I was learning things about God's creation, about the trees and and, and the dolphins. And now I'm out there with these ants, and, and I started thinking about what goes on down there in, in those ants, you know, down underground. And and I started talking to God about it. And it's like I was realizing. I'll bet there. We think we know a lot about what goes on underground with ants and you know all the little the queen and this that and other. But I bet you there's so much more that goes on that actually benefits us. And you know, as I began to talk to God about ants, yeah, I know I'm strange. I worship in strange ways, but I began to talk to God about the ants and His creation, and it, worship broke out, and I found myself just. Thanking God for all the all that He's done. He's such a beautiful artist, and He's He's put His creation all around us. And here's what I want you to know this morning: if, if you're not spending some time outside in God's creation, you're you're missing out on some great worship. If you're not acknowledging His handiwork, you're missing out on some some great worship. It, it, he even tells us this in Romans chapter one, verses. Uh, 19 and 20. He says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, speaking of people, of mankind, God made it made it a knowledge of himself available to everyone. He says, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. God says, I use creation to show myself to people. And it's a wonderful thing to just get out, walk, pray, and, and, and the sunsets lately. I don't know if you've noticed, but they've been beautiful. And just to know God did that. He did not only just do it at the beginning, He sustains it every single day. And He changes it up. And it'll just bring out worship. Personally, I don't know about y'all. Some of you are sitting in the sun right now. You started in the shade. I noticed it's moved. Now you're in the sun. If you want to get up and move your chair, don't hesitate. Okay? But I, I like this outdoor worship thing. When we started the service this morning, I was hearing the, the birds above, above my head. Last Sunday, one of them left me a gift right here on the podium. But that's okay. That's all part of it, too. But I, I like being out here. I like being in God's creation when we worship. There's just something special about worshiping God in His creation. You know, buildings are a great thing, but without the trees and the rocks and all the other things in nature, there would be no buildings. It all started here. Matter of fact, there's an interesting verse in Exodus 20 where God even tells man that when you get ready to build me an altar, I prefer you don't alter the altar this. Exodus 20, 25 says this, if you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it out of cut stones for if you weld your tool on it, you will profane it. God is saying I like it just like I made it. Just bring the stones just like I made them and build an altar out of that. I like it like that. You know what? I look around, I like it like that too. I like the way God has done it. So Sunday morning worship, it should be a lifestyle of worship. It should be something we do as we're praying every day where we just just break into worship and just tell God how wonderful He is, how beautiful an artist He is, and, and so many other things we can tell God. But it's a lifestyle. And, 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 I, and I think that was the case for these wise men because there was no hesitation for them. They immediately fell down and worshiped. And again, this is why they came. The whole purpose of coming was to, to culminate their worship. That it already started as a lifestyle. They came to offer that. So worship really should be the most natural thing for us. After all, the Bible says we're created to worship. After all, the Bible says we're created to worship by our Creator and we're saved to worship by our Savior. So how important is worship? So much that the enemy knows he can't stop man from worshiping. 
However, throughout the scripture, even well-meaning people at times fell down and worshipped angels. They fell down to worship apostles and other men, but they were always rebuked for that. You see, the enemy knows he can't stop man from worshiping, so what he does is he tries to change the object of our worship. The modern church has its own brand of worship temptation. Doesn't mean we always fall for it, but the temptation is always there. It's to give worship status to other things. Things like the music or the buildings or some of our formalities or traditions. Perhaps the most prevalent object of our worship is ourselves. You say, well, I would never worship myself. Really? Self-worship happens any time the focus of our Sunday morning worship time is about me. That becomes self-worship. When my comforts are what has, has grabbed my attention, is the, is the air conditioning set at the right temperature? Did I get to sit in my pew? Are they singing the songs that I like? Are they doing things the way I want to? Would the preacher stop talking on time? Whatever that means. I mean, all of these things, when it becomes about my comforts or when it becomes about my preferences, when we come and, and, and we're focused already on me and what I like, we, we've begun to worship, but it's self-worship. Sometimes it's so subtle. Most times. It's so subtle that we fail to recognize we've elevated things and even ourselves to worship status that God alone should occupy. But the Magi, they not only focused on the right recipient of worship, but on the excellent manner in which they brought their worship. Look again in verse 11, the second half. They fell to the ground and worshipped him, and then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Bible says, then. In other words, they not only brought their worship, but then came the overflow of their worship. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. These were expensive gifts representing excellence for the one, the only one, who is worthy of their worship and their excellence. Now, there's a lot of ways to bring excellence in our worship. So let me ask you, what's in your overflow? Only you know. But I can give you a hint. Whatever is in your heart will be evidenced in your overflow. What's in your heart for God will come out as an overflow of your worship. It's heart stuff. For them, it was heart stuff. It wasn't an afterthought. Gold. Gold was a precious, valuable gift fit for a king. So what did they do in their preparation for worship? They gathered gold to take to him. Frankincense was a costly, beautiful fragrance that, that spoke of deity. Again, in their preparation, they gathered frankincense. And then myrrh seems a little out of place till we know the whole story. Myrrh was a gift of compassion, but it pictured death. It was a gift for a mortal who was going to die. And this would be a picture of this child's future. These were three gifts that were well thought out and very intentional. Why? Because these magi came to worship. They came for the purpose of worshiping, and these gifts would need to represent the overflow of their hearts. They came to Bethlehem 
prepared to worship in an overflowing way. Today, some folks will come to church. Come to church hoping that worship will find its way into their Sunday morning routine. The lesson here from the Magi is that we should be preparing all week long, even longer than that maybe, to, to come together, but not to find worship, but to bring worship, to bring our worship with us. The Magi's gifts were not in addition to their worship. Rather, they were an expression of their worship, given out of the overflow of, of their hearts. And so many things fall under the umbrella of dependence. We could preach a whole series of sermons about what goes on under our dependence on God. But I believe that relationship with God through worship of God should be the most important part of all. Amen. After all, we're created by the Creator to worship, and we're saved by the Savior to worship. For anyone listening today, maybe those who are here, maybe those that will be on the, uh, the internet watching, I just want you to know that worship that happens through obedience to God's Word about the Gospel is the way that salvation happens. In other words, we become totally dependent on Jesus, on what happened on that cross, His shed blood for our sin. Because there would be no other way. This would be the only way to salvation. And He told us in His Word, I've come, I've died for you. If you will put your faith and trust in Me, in other words, your dependency, depend on me, I'll bring you across the finish line. And even before then, we'll have a great relationship under the umbrella of dependence. It happens by faith. And what Jesus has already told us he's done for us. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we um, so much of the time we just need to get back to the to the heart of worship, as the song says, and realize it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. We've uh, replaced Jesus in our worship with so many other things sometimes, and not intentionally. We hadn't set up idols, or, 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 and never would we intentionally do that, but we've just let things get in the way, get in between us and our worship of you. We made it difficult. We made it, uh, we made it a, forma a formality, Lord, and You've taught us that we can worship literally while we sit and watch ants do their thing or listen to the wind blowing through the trees. Lord, because you have shown us yourself in your creation, we can begin to worship just by becoming aware of all that's around us. It's such a beautiful gift. And we're so grateful for your creation because it shows us who you are and it brings us back to that heart of worship. Lord, I just thank you that we live in a such a, a special country that, that I believe you, you created for us and you blessed us with and helped us to get this way and that we are today. And we thank you for this flag that we live under. But more than anything else, we thank you for this Christian flag because in that you have brought us into the family of God through the blood of Jesus. And you have told us I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. I'll protect you. I'll be at your right hand. Lord, we just need to live in, a, in an ongoing attitude of dependence on you. And that should spur on an ongoing attitude of worship. We're so thankful to you, Lord. For Jesus, who saved us, for the Holy Spirit, who walks us through this life. For you, dear Lord, for being our Father, we're so grateful for this relationship that we did nothing to obtain. You did all the work. You simply offered it to us and then gave us that faith to say,
that's a good deal. I'm going to depend on God from this point forward. So thank you for that, Lord. Be with us. Help us to walk with you every day. Help us to spend time literally in worship every day, preparing for that moment when we'll come together and lift our voices in corporate worship. And I ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all have a wonderful day. And when you see an ant, thank God for the ants. All right? <laughs>